While I was uh, in college uh, attending Azusa Pacific University uh, from 76 to 1980, and by the way, we have a gentleman here today that I actually went to school with. He, he graduated in 81, I graduated in 80, but he had a master's degree. I only had a BA so at the time. So I want to th thank you, brother, for being here this morning. Uh, from Portland, Oregon. So you have, uh, you've traveled a long way to see family, so it's good to see you. Uh, I sang in uh, Mel Corral. You might not have known that. Uh, it was a 50-member uh, group. Uh, it was awesome. I've talked to you about it before. Uh, great worship. We had a wonderful time. Uh, and I've actually told you this story before, but I have to tell you it again because uh, if I had to pick a song that just represents my faith, that, that moves me, that means a lot to me, and I'm sure you have one right now on your mind, like what yours is, it could be a chorus, you know, it could, could be an old hymn. Uh, for me, uh, when we uh, got together behind the stage at churches, and I think I've sang in every church in Los Angeles uh, in the four years that we did concerts, uh, we would warm up behind the stage. We'd form a giant circle in our, remember the three-piece suits? Uh, we had those on all young men in our, you know, teens and 20s. Uh, we'd form a giant circle, and the a cappella, we would sing uh, various songs, but we typically would sing this song. And can it be? that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Shocking question, isn't it? Uh, died he for me who caused his pain, for me to him who death pursued. Amazing love, they say. How can it be that thou my God should die for? Kind of the likes of me. Uh, you know the refrain, do you not? Amazing love, how can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? Uh, that pretty much sums up how I, I view my salvation. Uh, still, after all these years, I became a Christian in 1967 uh, when I was nine. Uh, it still amazes me that he saved me. And I'm glad my, I think my mother's here today. She's probably glad that God saved me too uh, <laughs> because the family kept telling her he's going to be a criminal if something doesn't happen. So uh, thank God that my parents shared the gospel with me. And I, I listened to him uh, and got saved. And that song means much to me. So do you have a song? Don't tell me, but do you, do you have a song? in mind? You do, don't you? That's something that's meaningful to you. And when you hear that song, sometimes in, in worship or if it comes on the radio or whatever, uh, it, it's emotional, isn't it? Yeah, it is real emotional because you remember back when you weren't saved uh, and then when you got saved. And it's that simple grace of God. So with all that I know, all of, all of the degrees I attained in life and all those things, they basically don't mean that much to me. What matters is he saved me. So when you think about that, and you think about ancient Israel, they had their songs. You know that. That's the Psalter. They had their worship songs. But they had a song that they sang once a year. It was one of their favorite tunes. They sang it at Passover, uh, and it was Psalm 135. Uh, this is one of the songs that they wove into their worship to remember the fact that God had saved them. He saved them nationally, and he saved them spiritually. And all throughout this song, uh, they, they sang about the character of God. Uh, and when you look at these 20 verses, um, they're wonderful verses because they teach you uh, basically uh, that true worship, if you want to really worship the Lord, uh, it is founded upon the true knowledge of uh, the living God, who he is. You cannot worship the true God unless you know who he is. And so this, this great psalm is almost like a systematic theology introducing us to the character of God because they, they want to focus on that character because that's the God who saved them. So uh, structurally, from a literary perspective, if you like English, do you like English? No one likes English. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this is, this is uh, put together kind of like a rhetorical device called inclusio. Uh, it's where you start out one way and then you end the same way. Uh, and that has great power. When a guy, so somebody preaches and they start out here and then they come back here and bam, they end kind of the same way. That's, that's this psalm. It starts out this way, praise God, and it ends that way, praise God. Uh, that, that's what you're, you should be doing. In the middle of that is, is, the, is the meat. The meat is the character of God. So if that doesn't work for you, that analogy, just think of it like a hamburger. The top bun is the first introduction. You need to praise God. The meat is the character of God. And the bottom of the bun is we need to get back to praising God. Really, this could be a short sermon, and we're done. We could probably go to Spartans and have like brunch or something, but, but we're not. Uh, so true worship focuses upon uh, the true knowledge of God. So in a culture that we live in, and this could be a whole sermon in and of itself, that has rejected absolute truth, that you can't absolutely know truth anymore, but you can absolutely know that that premise is true. So you know the premise is false because it's self-defeating. Uh, but welcome to our culture. It's insane. 
Uh, and so this particular uh, psalm, written uh, to remember Passover, when the Egyptians worshipped a pantheon of gods, uh, God comes along and says, oh no, those aren't gods, I'm God. And this is definitive. He's absolutely God. They are all false versions of me. So there's truth and there's falsity. That is absolutely true. Uh, and because that's absolutely true, uh, we worship a God who's going to show us who he is in this, uh, who's worthy of our worship. So let's dig in. What did Israel learn at Passover when they sang the, their version of N Can It Be? Well, uh, remember, we go to the, the top bun, right? You still with me? Top of the sandwich. I know you're probably hungry. It's really going to hurt people in the next service as we approach lunch. Uh, verses 1 to 3, we have what I would call a directive from God. So what is a directive? He says, uh, notice the words that he uses here. He's kind of repetitive. Uh, he says, praise the Lord, exclamation point. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, praise him. Uh, and it's italicized in the original text because it's, that word's not really there, but we get the idea. Uh, he says, praise him, O servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our Lord. Praise the Lord, for he is good. Gives you the reason why you should praise, praise him with that prepositional phrase. Sing praises to his name, and he gives you another prepositional phrase to tell you why you should praise God. Well, you should praise him because why? It's lovely. It's just like, it's like the logical thing to do. So uh, if you read this in the Hebrew text, you cannot help but see that all of those praises, there's four of them, they're all imperatives. Uh, and because it's an imperative, for me as a Christian, it means it's not, a, it's not an, uh, an, uh, an option. It, he's telling me, when you want to get involved with true worship, uh, you focus on the character of God and realize this is your obligation as, as a Christian. It just comes naturally, but, but do this. Pray, praise him, praise him. Uh, and he says it four times, four times in three verses. He gives you a command to praise God. And then in verse three, he switches from praise God to sing praises to his name. Uh, and so he goes from the verbal to the musical. So he says, if you can sing um, and even play an instrument or something, give, give that to God too. And that is a command in, Hebrew te in the Hebrew text. So we have five commands in three verses. Three verses. Have you, have you got what God wants you to do when it comes to worship? Praise him. Praise him. Uh, get, get on with it. And he tells you uh, why you should do this. So let's dig into what he says. Number one, he says you pr praise him, going back to the prepositional phrases, for he is good. Which leads to, I mean, these are all sermon series. Why is God good? I mean, think about why, why God, God is good. Well, God is good in so far uh, that he took, um, uh, took you, uh, who thought you were holy and okay, and showed you that you weren't, because he's absolutely holy, uh, and, and he saved you. He took you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, you who loved darkness, you who were disobedient to truth, um, you who were... You thought you probably were all that in a bag of chips and God would let you into heaven one day just because you're such a great, nice person. Uh, he took you who were blind to your own sin, showed you your sin, convicted you of your sin, and he saved you. How can you not look at that and say, boy, that's good. That's good because the opposite of that is not good. But he is good because he saved even you. Uh, and it's a parallelism in Hebrew because he says, uh, praise the Lord for he is good. And then he says, sing praises uh, to his name then the parallelistic word is lovely. So uh, pra praise him because it's good, and then praise him because it's lovely. Lovely is a Hebrew term that is used for finding excellent dirt. Now, as a landscaper, I, I used to be a landscaper. I love everything involving the lawn. When I retire, I've told you, you're going to probably pass me on 7100 pulling a tractor and a, and a mowing rig or something. I mean, that would be just like the dream job for me. I love to do those things. So when I think about like, Oh, awesome. It's embedded in the text. When you find awesome, rich soil and you're a farmer, you're going, oh yeah, I'm throwing my seed there. He says, when I think about the great character of God, how good he is to me, it's like finding just awesome soil. Now, I don't know how excited you are about the soil in your yard. And I've had many people ask me, I mean, a lot of people come up to me after church. I think it's a deep spiritual question. It's not. I've got this issue in my yard. And could you help me? You know, you begin to talk, you know, you got pine trees there, grass won't grow there. Yeah, I have pine trees there. Okay, okay. do you ever pick up the needles? Oh, yeah, occasionally. But I plant seed there and it comes up really fast and then it dies quickly. Okay, the ground's acidic. Huh? Yeah, it's acidic because of the pine tree. So you got to change your pH value. Do you have a soil test kit? No, I do. And for $49, I can loan it to you. No, uh, but, 
But you know, you gotta test the soil. I got one of those little kits, drop the tablets in, check the dirt. It got, it, the psalmist says, when I, when I check out God, I find that he's good to me. And he's like, wow, it's like I found the best soil on the planet. I just find that lovely. Uh, for another thing, he says, you praise him because he's the Lord. Uh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Why that? Well, what's that mean? Uh, that means Yahweh. That's the great name of God from uh, derivative, derivative of the, the verb I am, Exodus 3, 14 to 15. We've talked about this before, but in case you've forgotten, because brain cells die daily, do they not? We need to go back and talk about this again, because um, you might, might not even be able to find your car in the parking lot after the church service. So let's think about this. Uh, we, we praise God for he is the Lord, not capital L with a sm small O-R-D. That would be Adonai. This is the Lord. This is his like main name. This is his covenant name. So when Moses said to the, you know, the Lord at the burning bush, uh, I need a name if I'm going back to Israel to be the deliverer in my 80s. Like, I gotta, well, who do we call you? What's your name? God says, just tell him, I am sent you. You're a verb. Yes, I'm a verb because I'm ontologically around all the time, outside of time and space. So you think about why you would praise the Lord, the great covenant God. I'll give you a couple quick reasons uh, why. Number one, he's the uncaused one who created the, the magnificent chain of cause and effect. Because cause and effect, if you think about it logically, can't go back and reverse to infinity. It cannot, because there always has to be what? The first cause. But since you can't cause yourself, you need something outside of the chain of cause and effect that's greater than cause and effect to create it. That's God. He created all things. Why he's the created one? So he says, praise him. Uh, praise him because he's the complex one. He's he created all the specified complexity that we see. And if you're into science, and, and, and many of our people are, and you're studying science, and you see that complexity, you think of that complexity that's so specified, and that should cause you to sit back at your, at, your, at your little workstation and go, man, God's awesome. Because he's greater than the specified complexity. That's the Lord. He is the one, unlike us, uh, who had no potentiality for being. We were all potential, were you not? You're not? You were at one time just a thought in your mommy and daddy's not mine, correct? And then they had a potential and boom, you were actualized. Uh, God was never actualized, why? Because he's the I am, he always is. Uh, he's the existent one, according to Colossians 1, 16 and 17, Jesus is the glue of the cosmos. He not only created it, he holds it all together. He's the one who gives substance to the teleological argument that behind every design is a designer. How could there not be a designer of the vast cosmos and all of its complexities? He gives meaning to that. He gives meaning to the, the moral argument, which says behind every law is a lawgiver. Well, all the laws that we have didn't just come out of thin air. No, behind the laws that we see is the God, the lawgiver, who puts that moral concept in our minds. That doesn't come from an evolutionary system where there is no God, and we just happen to throw laws together. No, absolute laws came from an absolute lawgiver, God. What does he say you should do for, toward that God? Praise him, praise him, praise him. Uh, moving from the call to praise God, he gets into the meat of the thing and talks about God. So come with me, this is like a systematic theology. He's gonna dig into the character of God. Um, this is in a, from a hermeneutic, a Bible study methods format. This is the meat of the passage. So what does he tell us to do here? Well, he says we need to remember at our own Passover, and we, we, we just partook of communion, which is remembering Passover, the fact that the blood of Christ was applied to the doorpost of your heart at the moment of faith whenever you got saved and the death angel passes over you. Amen to that. It means you have life eternal because God has forgiven your sin. Uh, and so when you think about your own Passover, you think about the character of God. Well, what kind of God is he? So in verse four, he's gonna start telling you what kind of God he is. So in that verse, he tells us that God is a, he's a, he's a part of the disclosure of God is, he's a choosing God. He chooses. Um, Notice what it says in verse four. It says, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. He's a choosing God. Now you think about when God was in, in the garden with Adam and Eve and creating all the trees and all the beauty, he said, of any of these trees, you can enjoy them. Enjoy your freedom to choose. Eat any tree that you want. I just placed a limit on one tree. Which tree? You know the story? Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Enjoy all of those. Satan comes along and basically tells him, man, God is just no fun. Hath God said? 
you can't eat of that tree? How unfair that is. And so we know what happened. So they, they ate. So when they fell into sin, and, and we all went with them, um, God could have said, because he's absolutely holy, when they sinned against him willfully, God could have said, that is it. I am done with you. I am holy. You are unholy. No, no one, no one is entering my heaven because you're evil. Did he do that? No, no. He, remember, he's a choosing God. He chose at that time to be merciful and to be gracious. And so he promised them a deliverer in Genesis 3, 15, the great seed passage, that the seed would come uh, and, and the devil uh, would afflict the, the, the seed uh, with a minor blow, but the seed, the Messiah, would come and to deal a death blow to the devil. And that, by the way, if you're despondent because of news and things going on in the world and the country, just look forward to Genesis 3.15 because the Messiah is going to deal a death blow to, to the devil. But anyway, back to my sermon. That was just extra. <laughs> See, God, God chose. He chose to be gracious toward us. To, he chose to bring the deliverer, the seed, the Messiah through the line of Seth. He chose to bring the, the seed, the Messiah, through the people, through the nation of Israel, through Abraham. Uh, he chose uh, unconditionally, he chose Abraham. He unconditionally chose uh, the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49, uh, nine, uh, 10 to 12. He chose Judah to be the tribe through which the Messiah, the seed, would come. He unconditionally chose David's line, 2 Samuel 7, to be the line of the king, the Messiah, through which he would come. And that's all validated in Matthew chapter 1 when the Messiah comes. He unconditionally chose Jacob to be the, the, that people for himself, to be his own possession. He, according to Deuteronomy chapter seven, he unconditionally chose Israel to be his people, to be his missionaries to the planet uh, because they were the least of all the peoples. Not because they were the smartest, the best looking, etc. No, the least of all pe people, the Messiah was prophesied to come through them. God took them and called them to obey him after he chose them. Think about this uh, concept of, uh, we would call it in theological circles, election. Does God choose? Yeah, yeah. Romans 8, for whom he foreknew, because he's omniscient, he also predestined based on that foreknowledge, to become conformed, what does he want from us? That we would be conformed to the image of his son, that we would be, look like Christ, that he might be the firstborn among the many brethren. And whom he predestined, what did he do? What does it say that he did? Whom he called, these he also justified in his court of law. Whom he justified, these he also, well, glorified on the day when that happens. But what is the process in these deep waters? That God in his omniscient knew all things. Remember, he's the I am outside of time and space. He knows what was happening in the present, what happened, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago. He knows what's going to happen in 10,000 more. He knows time. He's outside of it. And what did he do? Out of his love, he made a choice. And he chose people to be his people. Here's the thing, did he have to choose anybody? No, he didn't have to choose anybody. Why? Because he's absolutely holy. So the fact that he chose anyone is a sign of his grace and his mercy. So stop trying to figure out predestination, election, because it's, well, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the mysteries belong to secret things, belong to God. I have said under some of the greatest minds in Christendom to try to explain all that, they can't do it. They can give it a good shot. But God says, you know, it's like, well, who are the elect? I don't, I don't know. Uh, well, point them out to me. I don't, I don't know who they are. Uh, but I know that I'm one because I trust in Christ. I, I'm, he, I'm elect. He chose me. Why did he choose me? Out of his free love and grace. And I am so glad he chose somebody because he didn't have to choose anybody. Because holiness demanded he chose nobody. Aren't you glad he chose you? He's a choosing, choosing God. Uh, and so it, don't stumble over all of that all the time. You can think about it to a point, but, 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 but stop and give thanks for the fact that he chose you. And then you can take it up with him when you see him. God, could you explain this to me? He is a choosing God. That's why he should be praised. He's a sovereign God, verses five to seven. Sovereign means he controls all things at all time and nothing gets by him, nothing. Verse five, for I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is above all gods. What, remember he's thinking about the Egyptian pantheon. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for rain, who brings forth the wind and his treasuries. He's in control of all of the cosmos, all of the things seen and unseen, all of it. If you have a bad fishing trip and catch zero, who is in control of the trout? 
Trust me, I've had these prayers fishing before. I've actually dropped my little pole in the water. It's like, God, you control all the fish in this huge lake. Just bring them to my pole and caught zero. Anyway, and I believe in the sovereignty of God. Praise God, you're sovereign. You, you allow me to be skunked again, and uh, it's painful. But I've had those prayers. He controls all of these things. So uh, think about it. I mean, he, 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 it says he can do as he pleases. So does that mean he can do anything? I had somebody tell me this last Sunday, God can do anything. And I said between the services, oh, no, he can't. And they were like, huh? No, he has limitations, doesn't he? Because there's things he can't do because he's holy. Uh, Henry Thiessen wrote a systematic theology on the New Testament and the Old Testament. And um, I, I had to read it in grad school. Here's what he says about God. He says, there are some things which God cannot do. Why? Because they're contrary to his nature as God. Like what? Uh, he, he cannot look with favor on iniquity, Habakkuk uh, 1.13. He can't deny himself, 2 Timothy, uh, it, uh, oh, I wrote the wrong verse down. It's in 2 Timothy. You can find it. Um, <laughs> he can't lie, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. He can't, be tem- he can't tempt or be tempted, James 1.13. Further, he cannot do things which are absurd, like create a... <laughs> yeah, can God create a rock so heavy he can't pick it up? Uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> trust me, I've heard all of these questions. Uh, he can't do things that are absurd or self-contradictory, self-contrad- such as make material spirit a sensitive stone, a square circle, or wrong to be right. A, a sensitive stone. This, this came from California. I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, God can't do those things. That's illogical. But he's in control of all things. So it means he's directly in control of uh, a Scirocco going across the Egyptian desert. Uh, he's in control of a whale moving through the water. Uh, the currents uh, in the Gulf. He's in control of all of those things. So if he's directly in control of those things and none of, nothing happens that he is not aware of, imagine his mind, nothing. What does that mean to your life? Well, boy, he's worthy of my praise. Why? Because he's in control of all things. And he's, he's, if he's in control of all things, then my life's going to be okay. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, for those uh, who love God and to those who are called, called, called according to his purpose. What's that mean? Well, that means he's sovereignly at work in my life if I just lost my wife. He's sovereignly at work. Uh, that means he's sovereignly at work in the dysfunction of your marriage. He's sovereignly at work in the loneliness that you feel as a single. He's sovereignly at work uh, when you struggle with a, with, a, with a child that's wayward. So he's, he's sovereignly at work um, in your life if your, your mate is unbelieving, but you were both unbelievers when you got married, then you got saved and your mate didn't, and that doesn't understand what you did. He's sovereignly at work in all of that. Why? Because that's who he is. And because he's good, we know that he's going to do good things in your life to bless you, because you can trust him because he's sovereign. He's worthy of praise. That's true praise, focusing on the character of God. It says in verses 8 to 11, uh, we should uh, focus on praise, true praise, because he's a redemptive God. Verse 8 says, He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into their midst. O Egypt, upon Pharaoh, upon all of his servants, he smote many nations. He slew mighty kings like Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan, uh, and all the king, kingdoms of Canaan. See, God did miraculous events in time and space to free Israel from Egypt. The 10 plagues, he destroyed the Egyptian pantheon. That was their pantheon. He broke the back. He started with the the God of the water, the Nile. He started out that way. It ended with the death of the firstborn. He wiped out their entire system to say, no, I'm God, the living God. And imagine when they actually got into the land of promise uh, that God... uh, gave to them because the, the land was so wicked. It says in Leviticus that the land was so wicked it spit out the inhabitants. Their sin had so tainted the land. When they took over that land, they took on uh, uh, great kingdoms like the Amorite kingdom, the, the, the Og, the king of Bashan, who was a giant like Goliath. Uh, they took on his kingdom. And if you read the, the, the Old Testament, they, they took 60 of his fortified cities. You have to ask yourself, they were slaves, not special ops warriors. <laughs> Can you imagine? And God's telling him, you're going to go up against 60 fortified cities up in the north of Israel, in the Transjordan area up near Syria, and you're going to take 60 other fortified cities. And they're like, hey, we haven't even been to boot camp yet. I don't even know how to use weapons. And weapons, where are our weapons? God's like, I'm your weapon. 
And so God gave him great victory because he's a God that redeems his people. He redeemed them with a mighty hand. You know, when he saved you, he did the same thing, didn't he? He redeemed you with a mighty hand. First Peter uh, chapter one says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. But he says, but you were, you were saved with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That's how you got saved. Chained to darkness with kings like Sihon and Og ruling over your life. You might've been an addict addicted to things, but he freed you. I mean, my friend, Alan Reason, had spent half of his life in uh, uh, California penal system, told me one day when we were gardening together, I understand the grace of Jesus greater than you. I'm like, look at him, he's covered in tattoos. He's got long hair. I'm like, are you kidding me? He goes, no, think about it, Marty. I lived an extremely wicked life. Your dad was a federal agent, your mom, you know, they loved God, you were raised in church. He said, you probably never done anything bad in your whole life. Well, not like you. And I'm like, well, I'm sitting here with a college degree arguing with a guy <laughs> that just got out of San Quentin. I'm like, Alan, I think you're right. Because he's looking at what God had done and we both experienced the grace of God. And when you think about how God saved you, it's kind of like wiping out Og, king of Bashan. Wow. He says, God is also a giving God, verse 12. It says, he gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people. He gave them who had no land a land, the land of Canaan. He gave it to them because the inhabitants lost it because of their sin. One day, the Lord is going to return, according to Matthew 25, return in glory and come back as the king of kings and give Israel their land back and evict the squatters. And we come back with them. We're studying this in Revelation on Sunday night, by the way, if you want to come. He's going to come back and give the land back. Think about God's giving. What has God given to you that's praiseworthy? Well, he gave you salvation when you didn't deserve it. Uh, he's given you the, the spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, to seal you until the day of redemption. Uh, he gave you his word to feed on every day to find wisdom and direction for life. He gave you this local church that loves God, preaches God, teaches truth, loves each other. This is a gift from God. It's a great church. He gave, he, you could go down the list. God is good to you. And because he's good to you, he's worthy of praise. Verse 13 to 14 says, God is also the, worthy of our praise because he is a judging God. It says, thy name, O Lord, is everlasting. Thy remembrance, O Lord, through all generations for the Lord will judge his people and will have compassion on his servants. Aren't you glad that when you stand before God on judgment day? Because according to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, we shall all as Christians stand before him and give account of how well we ran after uh, the Lord in our Christian walks. And he'll reward accordingly. Aren't you glad that when you stand before him, that the Father looks down and sees the blood of Christ applied to your life? That your judgment is just a test of how, how well you ran the Christian life. Not whether you're going to... Uh, heaven or hell it's no it's how well did you did you serve me how well did you serve me you have a god who will judge you but it says here he will have compassion on you aren't you glad that it, it won't just be the wrath of god that a godless person will experience but it's the judgment of god balanced by the compassion of god because he sees the blood of christ he's a judging god because he's a judging god you have to give account one day uh and that is praiseworthy and then in verses 15 to 18 he closes by saying uh, God should be praised because he's the living God, as opposed to the false pantheon or, that are fake gods. He says the idols of the nations, they're but silver, gold, work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, they don't see. They have ears, they don't hear, nor is there any breath in their mouth. That is an idol. An idol is made by man. Why in the world would you fall down and worship it? God's not like an idol, is he? And what is an idol? An idol, according to Erwin Lutzer, a former pastor of Moody Bible Church, is idol worship, is reducing God to a manageable proportion. Reducing God to a manageable proportion. If you take God in his greatness and reduce him down to which that your mind can understand, that's an idol. When they made an idol, they carved it and made it, and then they worshiped it. And he said, that, that is insanity. Because when you think about God, he's not the work of man's hands. He's the work of no hands. Uh, he has a mouth that can speak and speaks all through the word. He has eyes which do see, uh, according to the scriptures. He sees all things. He has ears that hear everything, and we will give account one, one day before him to give account of the words we've used. Uh, and he is the Lord, as we see, opposite that uh, an idol, because he's the essence of breath, because he took Adam and breathed life into his body, gave him a soul. He's worthy to be praised. That's why the psalmist concludes in verse 18, 
Those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. Whatever your idol is today, you will become like your idol, blind and incapable of living life. But if you know the Christ, the, the Lord of glory, you have much to praise for because why? Because he's given you life. And then what's the, the bottom bun at the bottom of our hamburger analogy? Or we could go back to the rhetorical construction. What's the bottom? What should you be doing? He says what you should be doing. Let's re review what you should be doing. Let's just read it. O house of Israel, do what? Bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, you priest, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, uh, that serve the ironic wine. Uh, you bless the Lord. You who revere the Lord, that's you. Uh, you bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. And by the way, what should you be doing? Praise the Lord. Why? Because of who he is. And who is he? He's, he's the God who redeemed you. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's sight. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. What's the refrain? Amazing love that took off chains. How can you not praise him? Let's praise. God, we praise you for salvation, so rich and free. Uh, may we delve deep into your character, always growing in our understanding of who you are. And may that be reflected in the words that we use to praise you as we focus on key facets of your character. For those who don't know you today, don't have a clue as to what we're talking about, uh, take the power of the gospel uh, and plant that seed in their life to where it brings forth life and unto eternity at the moment of faith. In Christ's name, amen.